Special thanks to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video. Hello guys, Winston here. If you know my history of videos, you probably know that I loathe cliched projects. I find making signs and word art to be soul-crushing endeavors. But one simple CNC woodworking project I really don't mind is spoons, or more generally, kitchen utensils. These are things that are more than cosmetic, they're legitimately functional, and you can tailor them to fit your needs, be comfortable in your hand, or match an aesthetic. You can make some fairly useful customizations to the humble spoon. Ever since I saw Ed Ford make a spoon using Carbide Create Pro way back in the day, I've thought, I can do better in Fusion. And then life got busy, and I never ended up making anything better until now. Originally, I was just going to find a cool spoon or spork off Thingiverse and bring it into Fusion or MeshCam, because that would be a pretty good exercise in two-sided machining. But none of the models that I found looked particularly good, so I concluded that I would have to design my own spoon. How does one design a spoon in Fusion 360? Well, there's basically two schools of thought. One is by sculpting or surface modeling. In Fusion 360, you can create primitive volumes and then stretch, combine, deform, and shape your way into an infinite number of freeform shapes. This is a really powerful technique, but it takes a lot of practice to be good at it. And I am not good at it. The other way to make a spoon is to do so through more traditional solid modeling methods by generating volumes through extrusion, revolving, and sweeping, among other techniques. This strategy is not as good at replicating organic shapes, though you can sometimes cheat it with tools like the variable radius fillet. But this is a great way to model things that you can break down into fundamental shapes. For example, a cylinder on a stick. Or spoons that have hemispherical bowls. Suffice to say, I'll be making my own spoon in the standard modeling environment because that's where I'm the most comfortable. But what kind of spoon should I make? I really don't want to make a spoon that just tries to replicate the look of a hand-carved spoon. Even if I could make a spoon that was precisely defined by numbers, that was perfectly symmetrical, and that I could reliably produce on a CNC, the world honestly already has enough wooden spoons that have the same flat paddle look. I personally have no interest in making a spoon that looks like every other spoon. I want it to go in the complete opposite direction of what you would consider a traditional spoon, and that to me meant eschewing smooth organic shapes, that also meant no cylinders on sticks, and that sure as hell meant not making the bowl of a spoon look like a geometric concrete planter, because good lord those have been done to death. But as I was thinking about this one day, I realized I could put my own twist on a faceted design and do it in a way that was true to my inner nerd. I would pull an Elon Musk and make a spoon that no one asked for. A spoon that gives the traditional tenets of spoon design the middle finger. I would make the Cyber Spoon, based of course on the absurd looking Cyber Truck. This I thought would be a legitimately fun CAD challenge since there are some pretty funky angles on the Cyber Truck. I'll go through my full design process in a separate video since that's probably too many nerdy details for one sitting, but if you're interested in seeing a breakdown of this design, I'll have a link in the description below to that second video. The general gist of how the Cyber Spoon was designed though, was that I extruded out a volume of material that matched the general side profile I wanted, then I whittled away at it with cuts that came in from various angles. Everything was mirrored since I had only been modeling half a spoon for efficiency, and then I shelled that volume to create the cavity of the bowl. I then modeled up a really quick angular handle that merged with the rest of the spoon. Now, the one thing I haven't told you yet is that I modeled this spoon parametrically. Why? Because the volume of this spoon is very important. Because this spoon is actually going to be a coffee scoop, and accurate volume measurements are essential for brewing rich, smooth cups of coffee. Coffee that's arguably as smooth as my segue to the sponsor of this video, Trade Coffee. Whether you're a coffee noob or a practiced home barista, if you've ever been stymied trying to find a new brew to fit your tastes, Trade is for you. By just taking a short quiz, Trade can quickly pick out a coffee that's tailored not only to your tastes, but also to your preferred coffee making apparatus and coffee additions. For me, that's usually just a bit of sugar and sometimes milk. I'm definitely on the noob side of the coffee spectrum though since I haven't yet upgraded to syrups. But hey, a little extra stirring isn't a problem when you have a CNC, right? Trade picked for me a selection of coffees tailored to my admittedly basic palette, and then had them conveniently shipped to my doorstep. Once you try each coffee that Trade sends you, you can rate it and Trade will pick new matches for you as it refines its understanding of your tastes. 
You can choose the frequency of deliveries to suit your drinking habits and receive coffee fresh from local roasters across the country. If you want to discover a new favorite brew, click the link below to get 30% off your first bag of coffee when you sign up with Trade, and that includes free shipping. Now, where was I? Oh yes, the Cyberspoon. Coffee scoops, at least in the US, are typically calibrated to a volume of two tablespoons. Since the geometry of my spoon isn't the most efficient from a box volume perspective, I decided to aim for a capacity of one tablespoon, or just shy of 14.8 cubic centimeters. Because the Cyberspoon is parametric, I can tweak the length and width to adjust the volume it contains, which I've calculated by filling the bowl of my spoon with another body and checking its size. What I can't really tweak is the height, because I'm limited by the thickness of the stock I'm using, which in this case is some walnut scraps just over 3 quarters of an inch thick. I'm using ratios to constrain the proportions of the Cyberspoon so that it retains the appropriate shape no matter how I scale the spoon. For the cam, I'm using some 3D pocketing tool pads for roughing as well as a couple 3D finishing strategies. On the bottom of the spoon, I'm using a parallel tool path for the bulk of the spoon's profile, but I'm also applying a 3D contour to deal with the steep sloping sides of the cyberspoon, where a longitudinally oriented parallel tool path would leave a coarser finish. On the top side of the spoon, I'm applying a 3D pocketing tool path within the boundaries of the model, then facing the flat top surface, and then using a scallop toolpath inside the bowl. I chose a scallop toolpath here because this toolpath offsets each pass a uniform distance from the preceding pass. This will ensure that the ball and mill I'm using has very consistent coverage over the surfaces even on the vertical faces. One thing to note here is that 3D toolpaths, unlike 2D contour toolpaths, don't offer the ability to generate tabs. So unless you model in your own tabs, you won't be able to flip your stock over and not have the spoon fall out as soon as you start removing material. I created six tabs on the cyber spoon, with the tabs on the business end of the spoon being a little wider for extra support. Details of how I constrain this toolpath will be included in the supplementary video. I also modeled in cylindrical bores to represent where my indexing pins would be located relative to the spoon. Creating a setup like this captures the full picture of how I'll be holding and locating my part. Now we can finally head to the CNC. To start things off, I'm going to be using side clamps to hold my stock in place. Even with such a small footprint, this piece of walnut still has some corner-to-corner -corner wobble to it, so adhesive work holding is not an option. With a 1-inch surfacing bit, I manually jogged my CNC back and forth over the stock to get a perfectly flat side. I then set that height as my zero. This is basically the most accurate you can get for establishing your Z height. I swapped in a quarter-inch downcutting end mill to begin roughing in the details of my spoon. For this project, I received some brand new end mills to evaluate from Harvey Tool, who's branching out into the woodworking space. These tools have a specialized geometry compared to their metalworking tools, and they have more aggressive helix angles on them than some of my other downcutting tools. Generally, the more helix angle you have, the better sidewall finish you'll get because you have more shearing action spread over a larger length of cut. If you've ever tried to cut styrofoam with a knife, you know the physics of this intuitively. The closer to horizontal your knife is, the smoother your cut is. The only downside I can see to a steeper helix angle is that it augurs chips downwards more aggressively, which isn't necessarily desirable for slotting cuts where dust will get packed down into deep valleys, but for pocket clearing, adaptive style roughing, and finishing tool pads, that helix angle leaves a really great finish. Anyway, suffice to say, this tool worked as expected. After roughing out the stock, my cyber spoon was starting to take shape. I then swapped in an 8th inch ball end mill to run my finishing pass. On version 1, I used a parallel toolpath for everything. This took about 10 minutes to run because I was using a meticulously small step over of about 5% of the tool diameter. Even then though, you can see some of the small artifacts of my finishing toolpath on the sidewalls of the cyberspoon. My later iteration would utilize a contour finishing toolpath on these faces. I then bored out pinholes for the flip side operation. Using that same boring operation, I put matching holes into my supplementary wasteboard and used two clamps to hold my stock down. The pins would prevent my stock from sliding around laterally. I then loaded up my quarter inch down cutting end mill and continued machining. On this side of the spoon, I reduced my depth of cut by a factor of two because the spoon was a lot more fragile now. Once I'd broken through the onion skin left by my first set of tool pads, only my tabs were holding the spoon in place, and those tabs were connected to some really thin material. Then it was time to swap in the 8th inch ball end mill for the final scallop finishing toolpath. path. 
These cuts honestly didn't sound all that great, which made me kind of nervous, but these spoons held together long enough for everything to run to completion. However, when I went to remove my spoons by cutting through the tabs, I broke one of them. Two takeaways here. One, oscillating multi-tools are far too violent for liberating delicate parts. A Dremel would have been much better suited to the job of cutting through these tabs in this case. Two, my spoon had a huge design flaw. The handle goes straight into a thin section of end grain, which is extremely weak being stressed in this manner. For Cyber Spoon Mark II, I went back into Fusion and used the push-pull tool to thicken the back wall of the bowl to make that connection to the neck much more secure. I also made the walls of the bowl about 0.2 millimeters thicker and the handle a full millimeter thicker. After holding the Mark I spoon, I'd felt that I'd created something that was just too light. It felt insubstantial and it could afford to be a little heavier. There was also a high risk of blowing out the walls on the original spoon, so making the spoon stronger overall was definitely desirable. This meant I also had to revise the overall length and width of the spoon to account for that lost internal volume, but that was no problem at all because this model was parametric. Mark II ended up being slightly wider than the original. The improved cam also meant that the steep sections of the underside showed almost no lines from the finishing toolpath. I would only need to lightly sand the spoon with 220 grit sandpaper to clean up these facets. And then, just to make the cyber spoon a little more resistant to food particles and oil ingress, and also ever so slightly strengthen the wood fibers themselves, I applied a Danish oil finish. As far as I'm concerned, most finishes that are allowed to fully cure are generally okay for incidental food contact. And here, this spoon is only ever going to be touching dry coffee grounds. It's no different than if you dropped a cookie on a wooden tabletop covered with a synthetic finish like polyurethane and then ate that cookie anyway. Just don't go around drinking hot soup from a spoon with a finish like this. And after drying, the cyber spoon was complete. Is this a practical utensil? Probably not. But does it bring me joy and delight? You better freaking believe it. If you want to take a deeper dive into the CAD and CAM for this project, I'll be posting a supplementary video where I talk through aspects of my model and toolpath design. I'll also be offering a digital download of my fully parametric Cyberspoon Fusion project on my website, which will allow for non-commercial use of this design if you want to machine your own Cyberspoon, or just dissect my CAD and CAM a little deeper. As usual, Patreon supporters at any level get access to my project files by default. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and thank Trade for sponsoring my video. I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.